Okay, it's time for some more AP Calc tips, and this time we're going to do one of the things that you guys suggested. How to remember the graph of sine and cosine and all those silly trig functions that you gotta remember. Hello everybody, I'm Carr and I'm making this video because honestly, I really wish that someone had made this for me because I just can't remember what the periods of all these functions are, what they start as, where, like, how they look, where their asymptotes are. It's not they're really annoying to remember, so hopefully this will help. So the first thing we gotta do is sine and cosine, so usually those are the easiest to remember. And basically, you have to remember that these guys are the simple weights. They just look like this. And basically the best thing to be able to get the graph really fast is just to think about it as a unit circle. So, for example, let's say we're dealing with sine and we want to find the graph of sine. So basically you know that your x is basically your angle theta here. So you know when this angle theta is zero, your y coordinate is going to be all the way down here. So your y coordinate starts at zero. So you know that your wave starts at zero, and then as you increase theta, your y coordinate goes up. So you turn this way, your y coordinate goes up. Then you immediately know that your graph has to start somewhere along here where this is zero, and then it has to originally go up, and then it has to go down and go back up. Okay, then how do you know what the period of sine is? How do you remember that the period is 2 pi? That part is pretty straightforward if you're looking at a unit circle, because every time you go around 2 pi, you go back to the original position. So that's why the period of sine is just going to be 2 pi. Alright, for cosine, let's say we're looking at cosine. Then, you know that when theta is equal to 0, it's just over here, and your x-coordinate, which is what cosine corresponds to, is going to be 1. Your x-coordinate is maximized over here. So you know that, basically, at x is equal to 0, it has to be at its maximum. And then it just waves down originally, because as you increase theta, it's moving to the left. So your x-coordinate is actually decreased. So that's why it looks like this. And then the reasoning for the period is exactly the same. Now things start to get really annoying when you get a tan and cotangent and all that nonsense, okay? So let us talk about tan and cotangent. So these guys are kind of like the big S boys, okay? And the way that like I like to remember it is these are the only ones with a T in them. Like all the other ones, sine, cosine, cosecant, secant, they all have those like short letters. But T actually goes up. So the way that you remember that it's actually these long S's is because T is a long letter. So, it has a long graph. Okay, so now how do you actually know how it works? Of course, the easiest way to do it is just to look at a unit circle. So, let us draw our axes first. Instead of drawing the wave first, we're going to draw the axes first. We know that, like over here, your sine theta is 0 and your cosine theta is 1. And you know the tangent of sine theta over cosine theta, so you know it has to be 0 over here. Okay, and then as you move up, right, your sine increases and your cosine decreases. So, if you have sine theta over cosine theta, and sine increases and cosine theta decreases, this is obviously going to get even bigger. So, you know that it goes up here. But then on the other side, you know that it goes down here. Because you know that sine theta will become negative and cosine theta will stay positive, so it will become more and more negative. But all you have to remember is it looks something like this. So now, how do you know where these asymptotes are? Well, asymptotes are wherever the denominator is equal to zero, right? So when's cosine theta equal to zero? That's right, when the exponent on the unit circle is equal to zero. So that's when your thing is pi over two, or when your thing is three pi over two and you go all the way around. So you know that you have a asymptote every time you go to here, or you go around to the bottom of the unit circle and then back again and back again. And you see that they're separated by pi. So every pi you have an asymptote. And by the way, we're talking about tan right now. And then the way I like to remember it is I just remember that this S shape repeats every time there's a new asymptote. So, like, if the asymptotes are every pi, then you know that the period itself is going to be pi because this shape is always just going to be like this, like this, like that and repeat every pi. And then cotangent theta, I don't like to think about too much. Like, I just do the straightforward way to go from tan I first think about tan and then I go to cotangent because it's like really easy to go from one to another. Basically, if you do one over infinity, it goes to zero, right? So all these asymptotes turn into zero and then everything that's zero goes to infinity. And because cotangent is the opposite of tangent, it actually slopes in the other way. So you know that it's zero here, you know that it's infinity wherever the tangent was zero, so you know that it just goes like this. And then it's the same concept, you have your um, asymptotes every pi and then it repeats every time. Okay. Now we'll talk about secant and cosecant. Now these guys are the ones that I could never remember, but like what you have to remember is that it's like u's and upside down u's. Now like I like to use the same approach as I use for tan. So I basically take my sine curve, right? 
And if I want to go from sine to cosecant, you got to do 1 over it. So basically, we know that all our zeros go to infinity. So there will be an asymptote here for our new uh, cosecant function. There will be an asymptote here because 1 over infinity, 1 over 0 is infinity. And then 1 over 1, which is here, is just going to be 1 again. So you got it goes to infinity here, it goes to infinity here, and it goes to 1 here. So you just draw your u's in. And boom, you got a u. And then you do the same thing here. All these guys go to negative infinity, these guys go to negative infinity, and this stays at negative 1, because 1 over negative 1 is just negative 1. So then boom, you got another u. Epic. And then once you've drawn these first two u's, you see that sine repeats, so that means your cosine has to repeat as well. So the period of your cosecant is just going to be exactly the same as your sine period. And then once we're done with that, we can just erase our sine graph and we're left with our cosecant graph. Perfecto! And then you can do the same thing for secant, but I just like to remember that secant is just you shift it over left one. Because you know that cosine theta is equal to one here, so in order to get from cosecant to secant, you have to shift it over to the left so that it's one at x is equal to zero. So everything gets shifted over by like half a little bit. So there and then shifts over like that. Okay now inverse functions like once you know the actual functions it's really easy to get the inverse function because if you know that sine theta looks like this right basically you know that an inverse function is reflecting it over this line over here. So essentially what that does is it makes it look like this. Okay, so now we have this reflected thing. I unfortunately do not know this, but you probably know that functions have to satisfy the vertical line test. So, like, clearly this doesn't satisfy the vertical line test, even though we found that it's the inverse function of sine, the sine inverse, right? But that doesn't make any sense. How could you have a function that doesn't satisfy the vertical line test? That's why we restrict the domain of inverse functions. This is a really easy way to remember how to restrict the do domain. So essentially, we want to cut off parts that make it not satisfy the vertical line test. So, in this case, we want to cut off this part because it conflicts with the bottom part, so that's good. And then we want to cut off this bottom part so it doesn't conflict with this part over here. So epic! Now we literally have that our domain is limited to negative pi over 2 to pi over 2. Or a range, sorry. And if we want to just get our final graph, we just erase this. And hooray, this is your graph of inverse sine. And then it makes even more sense for cosine, right? Because let us try do the same strategy again. So cosine kind of looks like this, right? Okay, so if we flip it over this line over here, then it looks kind of like this. All right, now we want to get rid of parts that are conflicting and causing our vertical line test not to work. So we just get rid of this part. And boom, you're left for, with 0, 0, 2, pi. Wow, very nice. And we just erased the part that we deleted so that it would satisfy the vertical line test. And nice, this is our graph of cosine inverse. So this would be negative 1, this would be 1, and then this would be pi. And basically the strategy works for everything. So if tan looks like this, right, then its inverse function literally just looks like this. And you erase this. And then you could repeat this over and over again for all whatever you want, secant, cosecant, cotangent, anything. So the main thing you gotta remember are the actual graphs, and then it's really easy to get the inverse graphs from that. So basically my strategy is is remember, cosine and sine are the weight. Then tan and cotangent are the tall guys. And that makes sense because they have t's in them. And then you gotta remember that your cosecant and secant are your u's. And once you remember this, just look at your unit circle, plug in numbers, and then like from that you could see where the u's go or where your t like s's go or where your waves go. Alright, I hope that was helpful. That is just the way I think about it. If I ever forget a graph, I basically just plug in a point and then draw what I know the rest of it looks like. Usually plug in zero because that's like the, the easiest thing to do, but yeah. Alrighty, thank you guys for watching. As always, if you enjoyed the video, leave a like and subscribe for more. Leave suggestions like this because I think that these are really good suggestions. I personally think that I would have benefited with someone teaching me how to remember a graph like this, but I guess the way that I learned how to do it works as well. Alright, that's all I got. Thank you guys for watching again, and see you guys next time.